I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Howison Lecture in Philosophy. Uh, as you know, our lecture this evening is Michel Foucault. Obviously, I don't really have to say much about him. Very many people clearly are very interested in what he has to say. For anybody who got swept up in here without knowing, I'll say a few things nonetheless. Um, uh, Michel Foucault is the holder of the chair of the history of history and systems of thought at the Collège de France, which, as you probably know, is the most prestigious uh, academic institution in France. It's all very paradoxical, uh, since Michel Foucault, although certainly prestigious, is not at all an ordinary kind of academic. He is suspicious of all the official titles and the claim to disinterested truth that has been associated with academia. It's odd, too, that he's a professor of something like the history of ideas or of systems of thought, since you probably know, too, if you've read the Archaeology of Knowledge, he's very s suspicious and attempts to undermine our usual notion of history as some kind of uh, continuous march of events or some uncovering of some truth which is gradually emerging or any other idea of history that anyone has ever had. And as for history of ideas, he's equally suspicious of and denies the importance of ideas in the direction of human affairs or as having any important effect on human practices. In his latest book, The History of Sexuality, it turns out that ideas serve something else called power and not that ideas are in any way controlling factors. The books that, have, uh, are so, uh, that are the main ones that uh, you probably already know and have been translated and studied and assigned and discussed a lot are, the, are his first important book, Madness and Civilization. And <laughs> come in. Uh, after that, The Birth of the Clinic. As you may or may not realize, but you will now, that there's a mob of people out all around there trying to get in here. And uh, Michel Foucault has made the suggestion, by the way, he says this is a very technical lecture and uh, difficult, and I think he, he wants to imply boring, and he suggests that, uh, every, that it would be better for everyone to leave now than to leave bit by bit during the lecture, or perhaps to, to listen in shifts that you could listen for, say, half an hour till you're bored, and then the other 800 people out there could come in and listen for the second half hour. But I guess we'll just have to go ahead with the people beating down the doors. After the order of things comes the archaeology of knowledge, which is Foucault's book of methodological reflection on what he's done up to that point. Then there's a six-year hiatus in which there are some interviews, but no major books, and it seems to me very fundamental changes take place in Michel Foucault's approach during that time. And finally, since that period, he's published two more books that are translated, Discipline and Punish, The Birth of the Prison, and the latest book available in, around here, The History of Sexuality. I understand there's already another book available in French, which is the second volume of this seven-volume projected history of sexuality which is on the view of sexuality among the church fathers. Now, it's very hard for me to convey how puzzling and paradoxical Michel Foucault is, so I found, but I found something that expresses it so well and so briefly that I'm just going to read it. Something written by Clifford Geertz in uh, the New York Review of Books in his review of the prison book. He really captures the strangeness of all this. Michel, I'm going to quote, Michel Foucault is a kind of impossible object, a non-historical historian, an anti-humanist human scientist, and a counter-structuralist structuralist. He writes in a terse, impacted style, which manages to seem imperious and doubt-ridden at the same time. His method supports sweeping summary with eccentric detail. Then he quotes Foucault, Do not ask who I am and do not ask me to remain the same, he writes 
in the introduction to the archaeology of knowledge. Leave it to our bureaucrats and our police to see that our papers are in order. At least spare us their morality when we write. And then Gertz concludes, whoever he is or whatever, he is, in any, he is what any French savant is or wants to be these days, elusive. And that seems to put him in a bag with a lot of other rather shady characters. But then, uh, but then Geertz goes on, and I think this is very important. And he says, but, and in this he differs a good deal that has, from what, in, sorry, and in this he differs from a good deal that has been going on in Paris since structuralism arrived. The difficulty of his work arises not from self-regard and the desire to found an intellectual cult only the instructed can join, but from a powerful and original a powerful and genuine originality of thought. Now, I think that is what has brought us all here. There is something very original and very disconcerting in what Michel Foucault does. It doesn't sound like ordinary philosophy. It isn't what one comes to expect from a philosophy lecture. It certainly won't be like any of the previous Howison lectures. But what Foucault does, it seems to me, is constantly call into question what we are and what we are doing to ourselves in our social practices. And he does this by taking up any topic that is familiar with us in our most ordinary practices and taking them up in such a way that makes them seem strange. And it seems to me that this may be something that philosophers once did and still do. And in any case, this way of approaching things is more like philosophy than it is like anything else I can think of in the academic world. Now, before I turn the lecture over to Michel Foucault, I want to remind you that the second of these public lectures on truth and subjectivity, this time sponsored by the French department, will be held here in Wheeler tomorrow. Same time, same place, probably same crowd. And they, there will also be two seminars in French, in which seminars meaning chances to ask questions and discuss with Michel Foucault. They, those will be Wednesday from 2 to 4 here, and a week from today, that is next Monday, from 4 to 6 in 2003, 2003 Life Sciences Building. And now it gives me great pride for the Howison Committee and great pleasure to present Michel Foucault. Je voudrais d'abord vous remercier pour votre présence, dont je ne sais pas si je dois dire qu'elle est trop nombreuse, euh, trop nombreuse pour les malheureux qui sont restés dehors, trop nombreuse en tout cas pour moi, car comme vous l'a dit à l'instant le professeur Dreyfus, euh, je compte vous présenter une, euh, enfin deux conférences sur des sujets qui sont relativement techniques. Par conséquent, je m'excuse auprès de ceux qui auraient souhaité entendre ici euh, des propos euh, plus généraux et intéressant à la fois l'existence du monde et leur vie particulière. Les choses étant ce qu'elles sont, je remercie euh, euh, d'autant plus le, euh, les personnes qui ont bien voulu m'inviter et à dire vrai, il paraît que je dois commencer par remercier les institutions. Alors je re remercie donc le euh, comité des Howison Lectures, le Comité for Arts and Lectures, le Graduate Council, le département de philosophie, le département de français, et ma foi surtout et au fond avant tout, euh, mes amis Berthe Dreyfus et Léo Berset. Well, now, shall we begin. In a work consecrated to the moral treatment of madness and published in 1840, a French psychiatrist, Leret, tells of the manner in which he has treated one of his patients. Treated and, as you can guess, cured. One morning, he takes his patient, let's call him uh, Mr. S, he takes Mr. S, his patient, into a shower room. He makes him recount in detail his delirium. 
Well, all that, says the doctor, is nothing but madness. Promise me not to believe in it anymore. The patient hesitates, then promises. That's not enough, replies the doctor. You've already made me similar promises, and you haven't kept them. And he turns on a cold shower above the patient's head. Well, yes, yes, I am mad, the patient cries. The shower is turned off. The interrogation is resumed. Yes, I recognize that I am mad, the patient repeats. But, he adds, because you are forcing me to do so. Of course, another shower. Well, says the patient, I assure you, however, that I've heard voices and seen enemies around me. Another shower. Well, then, says Mr. S. I admit it. All that is madness. I am mad. And, of course, he was cured. To make someone suffering from mental illness recognize that he is mad is a very ancient procedure in traditional therapy. To such an extent was one convinced of the incompatibility between madness and recognition of madness. And in the medical works of the 17th and 18th centuries, one finds many examples of what one might call truth therapies. The mad would be cured if one managed to show them that their hallucinations are without relations to reality. But the technique used by the French psychiatri psychiatrist Leray is altogether different. Leray is not trying to persuade his patient that his ideas are false or unreasonable. What happens in the head of Mr. S is a matter of indifference for Leray. The doctor wishes to obtain a precise act, the explicit affirmation, well, I am mad. It is easy, of course, to recognize here the transposition within psychiatric uh, therapy of procedures which have been used for a long time in religious and also in judicial institutions. To declare aloud and intelligibly the truth about oneself, I mean to confess, has in the Western world be, been considered for a long time either as a condition for a redemption for one's sins or an essential item in the condemnation of the guilty. The bizarre therapy of Leray may be read as an episode in the progressive culpabilization of madness. But I would wish rather to take it as a point of departure for a more general reflection on this practice of confession and on the postulate which is generally accepted in Western societies that one needs for his salvation, to know as exactly as possible who he is and also, which is something quite different, that he needs to tell it as explicitly as possible to some other people. The anecdote of Lurie is here only as an example of the strange and complex relationships developed in our societies between individuality discourse, truth, and coercition. The question is, what's this obligation to tell truth about oneself, which is imposed to everybody and even to the mad people if they want to become reasonable and normal people? In order to justify the attention I am giving to what is seemingly so specialized a subject, let me take a step back for a moment. This, after all, is only a means that I will use to take on a much more general theme, the genealogy of the modern subject. 
in the years that preceded the Second War, and even more so after the war, philosophy in France was dominated by what we could call the philosophy of subject. I mean that philosophy saw as its task par excellence the foundation of all knowledge and the principle of all signification as a stemming from the meaningful subject. The transcendence of the ego reigned. The importance given to this question was, of course, due to the uh, impact of Husserl. Only his Cartesian meditations and the crisis were generally known in France. But the centrality of the subject was also tied to an institutional context. For the French university, since philosophy began with Descartes, it could only advance in a Cartesian manner. But we must also take into account the political conjuncture. Given the absurdity of wars, slaughters, and despotism, it seemed to be up to the individual subject to give meaning to his existential choices. With the leisure and distance that came after the war, this emphasis on the philosophical subject no longer seemed so self-evident. Two hitherto hidden theoretical paradoxes could no longer be avoided. One, this philosophy of consciousness paradoxically had failed to found a philosophy of knowledge and especially a philosophy of scientific knowledge. Two, this philosophy of meaning paradoxically had failed to take into account the formative mechanisms of signification and the structure of systems of meaning. I am aware that another form of thought claimed to have gone beyond the philosophy of the subject during, during the years of which I am speaking. This, of course, was Marxism. It goes without saying, but it goes better with saying, <laughs> that neither materialism now the theory of ideologies successfully constituted the theory of objectivity and the theory of signification. Marxism put itself forward as a humanistic discourse that would replace the abstract subject with an appeal to the real man, the concrete man, desalienated, desalienation of man, and so on. It should have been clear at the time that Marxism carried with it a fundamental practical weakness the humanistic discourse hid a political reality that the Marxists of this period nonetheless supported. With the all too easy clarity of hindsight, what you Americans, I think, call the Monday morning quarterback. <laughs> Let me say that there were possible paths, two possible paths, that led beyond this philosophy of the subject the theory of objective knowledge and an analysis of systems of meaning that we could call semiology. The first of these paths was the path of logical positivism. The second one was that of a certain school of linguistic psychoanalysis and anthropology, all generally grouped under the rubric of structuralism. These were not the directions I took. Let me announce once and for all that I am not a structuralist, <laughs> and I confess with the appropriate chagrin that I am not an analytical, analytic philosopher. Nobody is perfect. <laughs> I have tried to explore another direction. I have tried to get out from the philosophy of the subject through a genealogy of the subject by studying the constitution of the subject across history, which has led us to the modern concept of the self. That is, that this has not always been an easy task, since most of historians prefer a history of social processes where society plays the role of subject, and most philosophers prefer a subject without history. 
This has never prevented me from using the same material that certain social historians have used, nor from recognizing my theoretical depth to those philosophers who, like Nietzsche, have posed the question of the historicity of the subject. So much for the general project. Now a few words on methodology. For this kind of research, the history of science constitute a privileged point of view. This might paradox seem paradoxical. After all, the genealogy of the self does not take place within a field of scientific knowledge as if we were nothing else than that which rat rational knowledge could tell us about ourselves. While the history of science is without doubt an important testing ground for the theory of knowledge as well as for the analysis of meaningful systems, it is also fertile ground for, st for studying the genealogy of subject. There are two reasons for this. All the practices by which the subject is defined and transformed are accompanied by the formation of certain types of knowledge and in the West, for a variety of reasons, knowledge tends to be organized around forms and norms that are more or less scientific. There is also another reason, maybe more fundamental and more specific to our societies. I mean, the fact that one of the main moral obligations for any subject is to know oneself, to explore oneself, to tell the truth about oneself, and to constitute oneself as an object of knowledge, both for other people and for oneself. A truth obligation for individuals. And a scientific organization of knowledge, those are the two reasons why the history of knowledge constitute a privileged point of view for the genealogy of subject. Hence it follows that I am not trying to do history of sciences in general, but only of those which sought to construct a scientific knowledge of the subject. Another consequence, I am not trying to measure the objective value of these sciences, nor to know if they can become universally valid. That is the task of an epistemological history. Rather, I am working on an history of science that is to some extent regressive, a history that seeks to discover the discursive, the institutional, and the social practices from which these sciences arose. This would be an archaeological history. Finally, a third consequence. This project seeks to discover the point at which these practices became coherent, reflective techniques with defini definite goals. The point at which a particular discourse emerged from those techniques and came to be seen as true. The point at which they are linked with the obligation of searching for the truth and telling the truth. In sum, the aim of my project is to construct a genealogy of the subject, the method is an archaeology of knowledge, and the precise domain of the analysis is what I should call technologies. I mean the articulation of certain techniques and certain kinds of discourse about the subject. I would like to add one final word about the practical significance of this form of analysis. For Heidegger, it was through an increasing obsession with techne as the only way to arrive at an, un at an understanding of object that the West lost touch with being. Let's turn the question around and ask which techniques and practices form the Western concept of the subject, giving it its characteristics play of truth and error, freedom and constraint. I think that it is here 
where we will find the real possibility of constructing a history of what we have done and at the same time a diagnosis of what we are. This would be a theoretical analysis which has at the same time a political dimension. By this word political dimension I mean an analysis that relates to what we are willing to accept in our world, to accept, to refuse and to change both in ourselves and in our circumstances. In sum, it is a question of searching for another kind of critical philosophy. Not a critical philosophy that seeks to determine the conditions and the limits of our possible knowledge of the object, but, but a critical philosophy that seeks the conditions and the indefinite possibilities of transforming the subject, of transforming ourselves. Up to the present, I have proceeded with this general project in two ways. I have dealt with the modern theoretical constructions that were concerned with the subject in general. I have tried to analyze in a previous book theory of subject as a speaking, living, working being. I have also dealt with the, with the more practical understanding formed in those institutions like hospitals, asylums, prisons, where certain subjects became objects of knowledge and at the same time objects of domination. Now, I wish to study those forms of understanding which the subject creates about himself. Those forms of self-understanding are important, for instance, to analyze the modern experience of sexuality. But since I started with this last type of problems, I have been obliged to change my mind on several points. Let me introduce at last a kind of autocritic. A kind, of course. It seems, according to some suggestions of Habermas, that one can distinguish three major types of techniques. Those which permit one to produce, to transform, to manipulate things. Two, uh, the techniques which permit one to use sign systems. Three, the techniques which permit one to determine the conduct of individuals, to impose certain wills on them, and to submit them to certain ends or objectives. That is to say, one, techniques of production, two, techniques of signification, three, techniques of domination. Of course, if one wants to study history of natural sciences, it is use useful, if not necessary, to take into account techniques of production and semiotic techniques. But since my project was concerned with the knowledge of the subject, I thought that the techniques of domination were the most important without any exclusion of the others. Analyzing experience of sexuality and history of experience of sexuality, I became more and more aware that there is in all societies, whatever they be, another type of techniques, techniques which permit individuals to effect by their own means or with help of other people, to effect a certain number of operations on their own bodies, on their own souls, on their own thoughts, on their own conduct, and this in a manner so as to transform themselves, modify themselves, or to attain a certain state of perfection, of happiness, of purity, of supernatural power, and so on and so on. Let's call this kind of techniques, techniques or technologies of the self. I think that 
if one wants to analyze the genealogy of subject in Western societies, he has to take into account not only techniques of domination, but also techniques of the self. Let's say he has to take into account the interaction between those two types of techniques, the points where the technologies of domination of individuals over one another have recourse to processes by which the individual acts upon in himself, and conversely, the points where the techniques of the self are integrated into structures of coercition. The contact point where are tied together the way individuals are driven and known by others and the way they conduct themselves and know themselves it, what it is what we can call government. Governing people in the broad meaning of the word at the, at this Pope, for instance, in the 16th century, of governing children, or governing a family, governing souls. Go governing people is not a way to force people to do what the governor wants. It is always a difficult, uh, a versatile equilibrium with complementarity and conflicts between techniques which assure coercion and processes through which the self is constructed and modified by himself. When I was studying asylums, prisons, and so on, I insisted maybe too much on the techniques of domination. What we can call discipline is something really important in this kind of institutions. But it is only one aspect of the art of governing people in our societies. We must not understand the exercise of power as pure violence or strict coercion. Power consists in complex relations. These relations involve a set of rational techniques. And the efficiency of those techniques is due to the subtle intrication of coercion technologies and of the self-technologies. I think we have to get rid of the more or less Freudian schema. You know the schema of the interiorization of the law by the self. Fortunately, from a theoretical point of view, and maybe unfortunately from a practical point of view, things are much more complicated. In short, having studied studied the field of government by taking as point of departure techniques of domination, I would like in years to come to study the government, especially in the field of sexuality, starting from the techniques of the self. Among such techniques, those oriented towards the discovery and the, formula and the formulation of the truth concerning oneself are extremely important. As if, for the government of people in our societies, everyone, everyone had not only to obey, but also to produce the truth about oneself. Self-examination, examination of conscience and confession are among the most important of those procedures. I would like to show the transformation through those two procedures of the old Delphic precept, know yourself, into the monastic precept, tell me each of your thoughts, omnes cogitationes. For this precept, born and developed first in monastic institutions, though this precept played, I think, a great role in the constitution of modern subjectivity. With this precept starts what we could call the hermeneutics of the self. This evening, I'll try to outline the way confession and self-examination were conceived in uh, uh, Greek and Latin philosophers. And tomorrow, I'll try to show you what they became in the early Christianity. 
the title of those two lectures could have been, in fact, and should have been, about the beginning of the hermeneutics of the self. It is well known that the main objective of the Greek school of philosophy didn't consist of the elaboration and the teaching of a theory. The goal, as you know, was the transformation of the individual, giving to his, to his being a quality which would permit him to live differently, better, more happily than other people. What place did the confession have in this? At first glance, and in all the ancient philosophical practices, the obligation to tell the truth about oneself occupies a rather restrained place. This was for two reasons, both of which remained valid throughout the wall of Greek and Hellenist antiquity. The first of those two reasons is that the objective of philosophical training is to arm the individual with a certain number of precepts which permit him to conduct himself in all circumstances of life without his losing mastery of himself or tranquility of spirit, purity of body or soul and so on. From this principle stems the importance of the master's discourse. It has to, to talk, to explain, to persuade. The, the master has to talk, to explain, to persuade. The master has to give the disciple a universal code of conduct for all his life. Thus, the verbalization takes place on the side of the master and not on the side of the disciple. Second reason. The second reason why the obligation to confess does not have a lot of importance in the direction of antique conscience is that the tie with the master was circumstantial or, in any case, provisional. It is a relationship between two wills, relation which does not imply a complete and definitive obedience. The disciple solicits or accepts the advice of a master or of a friend in order to endure an ordeal, bereavement, an exile, a reverse of fortune, or again one places oneself under his direction for a certain time of one's life, often, but not necessarily when one is young, so as one day to be able to behave autonomously and no longer have need of advice. Ancient direction tends towards the autonomy of the directed. In these conditions, one can understand that the necessity for exploring oneself in exhaustive depth does not present itself. It is not indispensable to say everything about oneself, to reveal one's least secrets so that the master may exert complete power over one. The exhaustive and continual presentation of oneself under the eyes of an all-powerful director is not an essential feature of this, techniques of di this technique of direction. But Despite this general orientation, which has little emphasis on the confession, one finds, well before Christianity, already elaborated techniques for discovering and formulating the truth about oneself. And their role, it would seem, became more and more important. The growing importance of these techniques is no doubt tied to the development of communal life in the philosophical schools, as with the Pythagoreans and Epicureans. It is also tied to the value accorded to the medical model, either in the Epicurean or in the Stoician uh, philosophy. 
Since it's not possible in so short a time even to give a sketch of this evolution in the Greek and Hellenistic civilization, I'll take two passages of a Roman philosopher, Seneca. They may be considered as rather good witnesses on pr this practi practice of self-examination and confession, as it existed with the Stoics of the imperial period at the time of the birth of Christianity. The first passage is to be found in the De Ira. Here is this passage. What could be more beautiful, writes Seneca, what could be more beautiful than to conduct an inquest on one's day? What sleep better than that which follows this review of one's actions? How calm it is, deep and free, when the soul has received its portion of praise and blame and has submitted itself to its own examination, to its own censure. Secretly, it makes the trial of its own conduct. I exercise this authority over myself, and each day I will myself as witness before me. When my, li when my light is lowered and my wife at last keeps silent, I reason with myself and I take the measure of my acts and my words. I hide nothing from myself. I spare myself nothing. Why, in effect, should I fear anything at all amongst my errors whilst I can say be vigilant in not beginning again? Today I will forgive you. In a certain discussion, you spoke too aggressively, you did not, not correct the person you were reproaching, you offended him, and so on and so on. There is something paradoxical in seeing the Stoics such as Seneca, but also as Sextius Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, and according so much importance to the examination of conscience whilst, according to the term of the Stoic doctrine, all faults, as you know, are equal, it should not therefore be necessary to interrogate themselves in each one of them. But let me, took, let me let us have a look at the text a little more closely. First of all, Seneca employs a vocabulary which, at first, glance appears above all judiciary. For instance, he uses words like cognoscere de moribus suis, causa meam dico. All that is typically judiciary. It seems, therefore, that the subject is, with regard to himself, both the judge and the accused. In the examination, Seneca, or the subject, divides himself in two and organ organizes a judicial scene where he plays both roles at once. Seneca is like an accused confessing his crimes to the judge. But, but if we look more closely, we see that the voc vocabulary is much more administrative than judiciary. It is the vocabulary of the direction of goods or territory. Seneca says that he is speculator sui, that he inspects himself, that he exam examines with himself the past day, totum diem mecum scrutor, and that he takes the measure of things said and done, he uses the word remitiri. With regard to himself, he is not a judge who has to punish is rather an administrator who, once the work has been done or the year's business finished, does the accounts, takes stock of things and sees if everything has been done correctly. Seneca is a permanent administrator of himself rather than a judge, a judge of his own past. 
the examples of the faults committed by Seneca and with which he reproaches himself are very significant. For instance, he has criticized someone and instead of correcting him, he has hurt him. Or again, he reproaches himself that he has discussed with people who were in any case incapable of understanding, understanding him. These faults, as he says himself, are mistakes. Why mistake? Either because he did not have in his mind the aims which the sage should set, set himself, or because he had not applied in the correct manner the rules of conduct to be deduced from them. The faults are mistakes in that sense, that they are, have in his mind the aims which the sage should set, set himself, or because he had not applied in the correct manner the rules of conduct to be deduced from them. The faults are mistakes in that sense, that they are bad adjustments between aims and means. Significant also is the fact that Seneca does not recall those faults in order to punish himself. This memorization has for object a reactivation of fundamental philosophical principles and the readjustment of their application. In the Christian confession, the penitent will be obliged to memorize the laws in order to discover his sins. But in the Stoic exercise, in Seneca's self-examination, the sage has to memorize his acts in order to reactivate the rules. One can therefore characterize this examination in few words. One, it is not a question of discovering a truth hidden in the subject. Rather, it's a question of recording a truth forgotten by the subject. Two, what the subject forgets is not himself, nor his own nature, nor his origin, nor a supernatural affinity. What the subject forgets is what he ought to have done, a collection of rules of conduct that he has learned. The recollection of errors committed during the day serves to measure the distance which separates what has been done from what should have been done. For the subject which practices this examination on himself is not the operating ground for a process more or less obscure which has to be deciphered. He is the point where rules of conduct come together and register themselves in the form of memories. He is at the same time the point of departure for actions more or less in conformity with these rules. He constitutes, the subject constitutes the point of intersection between a set, a set of memories which must be brought into the present and acts which have to be regulated. The examination, thus, has its logical place among the other stoic exercises, all of them being a way to incorporate in a constant attitude a code of actions and reactions, whatever situation may occur. Those exercises are, first, the continual reading of the manuals of precepts, that's for the present. The examination of the evils which could happen in life, the premeditatio malorum, so much for the possible. Three, the, the, the enumeration each morning of the task to be accomplish accomplished during the day, that's for the future. And finally, the evening examination of conscience, that's for the past, as you see, the self is not, in the case, a field of subjective data which have to be discovered. The self, is, uh, the, the self submits itself to the trial of possible or real past or future act.
facts. After the examination of conscience, which constitute a kind of confession to oneself, I would like to speak about the confession to others. I mean to say the expose of one's soul, which one makes to someone who may be a friend, an advisor, a guide. And this was a practice uh, developed in a several philosophical schools as the Epicurean or in the Stoician school. Another text of Seneca may also serve as an example of this practice of confession. It is uh, the beginning of the treatise De Tranquillitate Animi. Serenus, a young friend of Seneca, comes to, uh, to ask him for advice. It is very explicitly a medical consultation on his own state of soul. Why, writes Serenus to uh, Seneca, why should I not confess to you the truth as to a doctor, I do not feel altogether ill, but nor do I feel entirely in good health. Serenus feels himself in a state of malaise, rather like on a boat which does not advance but is tossed about by the rolling of the ship. He fears to stay at sea in this condition, in view of firm land and of the virtues which remain inaccessible. In order to escape this state, Serenus therefore decides to confess the truth to Seneca. But through this confession, through this description of his own state, he asks Seneca to tell him the truth about his own state. Serenus it is at the same time confessing the truth and lacking in truth. First point, he confesses the truth. He says that he wants verum fatiri, to confess truth. And what is this truth, this verum? Thoughts, secret thoughts, shameful desires, not at all. The text appears as an accumulation of relatively unimportant details, for instance, Serenus explains that he uses the earthenware inherited from his father, that he easily gets carried away when he makes public speeches, and so on and so on. But it is easy, beneath this apparent disorder, to recognize three distinct domains. That of riches, that of political life, and that of glory. To acquire riches, participate in the affairs of the city, gain public opinion, these are the three types of activity possible for a free man. The three commonplace moral questions that are, uh, that are asked by the major philosophical schools of the period. The framework of the expose of Serenus is not therefore defined by the real course of his existence, nor by a theory of the soul or of its elements, but by the classification of the different types of activity which one can exercise and the ends which one can pursue. In each one of these fields, Serenus reveals his attitude by enumerating that which pleases him and that which displeases him. The expression plaquette, me plaquette, is the leading thread of the analysis. For instance, it pleases him to do favors for his friends, it pleases him to eat simply but the spectacle of luxury in others pleases him. He takes pleasure also to inflate his orator oratorical style, and so on and so on. In thus exposing what pleases him, Serenus is not seeking to reveal what are his profound desires for him. It is a question of indicating as exactly as possible to what he is still attached and from what he is already detached. In what respect he is free and on what external things he is dependent. The verum fatiri which he proposes to himself is not the bringing into the light of day of profound secrets. It is rather in terms of the ties which attach him to things 
of which he is not the master. It is a kind of inventory of freedom. In the frame of a code of actions, it is not an enumeration of past thoughts. It is a balance sheet of dependences. But we have to go further. Serenus makes this confession not only in order to expose the true state of his soul, but also to learn from Seneca the truth about himself. And now, what is this kind of truth? Serenus needs and asks Seneca to tell him. A diagnosis? That is, in fact, what Serenus says. And that is what Seneca gives him. But this diagnosis does not consist in saying, here is what you are, here are the secret ills from which you suffer. Seneca contents himself with saying, do not believe that you are a sick man who cannot manage to be cured. You are a former sick man who does not realize that he has been healed. Seneca helps Serenus to situate himself on the path which should lead him to the terra firma of virtues, he establishes exactly the ship's bearings, but by itself, this diagnosis is, as you see, very short and elusive. But that's only the smallest part of what Seneca says. And the treatise De Tranquillitate Animi say, says much more than that. Which kind of answer does Seneca in this treatise give to the needs of Serenus. A philosophical theory? Not at all. A new expose of moral precepts? It is clear that Serenus does not need that. Serenus has shown in his confession that he knows very well the great moral principles which are necessary for a philosophical life. The truth Serenus needs is not a complementary knowledge. It is something added to the knowledge he possesses, to the knowledge of his own state, and to the knowledge of the moral precepts. This addition to what is already known is not a knowledge, it is a force. A force which is able to transform pure knowledge and simple consciousness in a real way of living. And that is what, what Seneca tries to do. What, that is what Seneca transmits to Serenus when he uses a set of persuasive arguments, demonstration, examples, in order not to discover a still unknown truth inside of Serenus, but to explain, if I may say, to which extent truth is true. Seneca's discourse asked for an objective not to add some theoretical principles, to, uh, not to add to some theoretical principles a force of coercion coming from elsewhere. Seneca's discourse has for an objective to transform truth in a victorious, in an incoercible force. Seneca has to give place to truth as a force. Hence, several consequences. In this game between confession of Serenus and Seneca's consultation, in this game between con confession and consultation, truth is not defined by correspondence to a reality, but by a force inherent to principles and which has to be developed in a discourse. Two, this truth is not something which is hidden behind or under the consciousness in the deepest and most obscure part of the soul. It is something which is in front of the individual as a point of attraction, a kind of magnetic pole which pulls him towards a goal. Three, this truth is not obtained by an analytical exploration of what is supposed to be real in the individual. This truth is obtained by rhetorical explanation of what is good for anyone who wants to approach the life of a sage. Four, the confession is not oriented towards the individualization 
of Serenus, of the disciple, by the discovery of personal characteristics. The confession is oriented towards the constitution of a self, which would be at the same time and without any discontinuity, subject of knowledge and subject of will. Five, if the role of confession and consultation is to give place to truth as a false, it, it is easy to understand that self-examination has nearly the same role. We have seen that if Seneca recalls every evening his mistakes, it is to memorize the moral precepts of the conduct, and memory is nothing else than the force of the truth when it is permanently present and active in the soul. A permanent memory in the individual and in his inner discourse. A persuasive rhetorics in the master's advices, those are the aspects of truth considered as a force. Then we may conclude self-examination and confession may be in ancient philosophy considered as truth gain and as important truth gain. But the objective of this truth gain is not to discover a secret reality inside the individual. The objective of this truth gain is to make of the individual a place where truth can appear and act as a real force through the presence of memory and the efficiency of discourse. We can see that such a practice of examination and of confession remains within the framework of what the Greeks for a long time called the gnome. The term gnome designates the unity of will and knowledge. It designates also a brief piece of discourse, a sentence, a few lines, for which truth appears with all its force and encrusts itself in the soul of uh, ordinary mortals. In the earliest form of Greek philosophy, poets and divine men told the truth to ordinary mortals through this kind of gnome, through gnomai. Gnomai, very short, very imperative, and so deeply illuminated by the, the poetical light that it was impossible to forget them and to avoid their power. Well, I think you can see that self-examination and confession as you can find them, uh, for instance, by Seneca, but also uh, in Marc Aurel, Marcus Aurelius, Epictet, and so on. Self-examination and confession, even as late as in the first century after death, were still a kind of development of this gnome. So we, we could call gnomic self the type of self which is proposed as a model and as a target by the ancient, by the uh, Greek and Latin philosophy, a self where the force of the truth has to be one with the form of the will. In sum, the self has to be constituted through the force of the truth. This force lays in the mnemonic aptitude of the individual and in the rhetorical quality of the master's discourse, and those depend for a part on arts of memory and arts of persuasion, so that technologies of the self in the ancient world are not linked with an art of interpretation, but with arts such as mnemotechnics and rhetorics, self-observation, self-interpretation, self-hermeneutics, won't intervene in the technology of the self before Christianity. And that's the point I'll try to explain to you tomorrow. Well, thank you.